Welcome. Welcome to Randolph Memorial Baptist Church. We are in the midst of all the activities that May brings, and one of the big things is graduations, and it goes for like two or three weeks, and you're all over the place, and it's every day that you seem like you're doing something. But we do have one quick graduation announcement for this morning. If you're graduating as a senior or in high school, or, in, or if you're, you've called in to graduate to celebrate with us today, we have a couple of college graduations. If you can meet in the back, and when you hear the handbell start panorama, if you'll come up and sit on the front pew, uh, then as soon as that song is done, uh, our chair of youth committee, Christy, is going to come up and be here, and I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to call the names out. We have a gift for you. You don't have to give a speech. That's the best thing. Uh, the thing I will say is we have more on the list than are here because it is a busy time. Not everybody can be here, and that's always the case, but we're going to still read all the names and the plans that they have turned in, and then those who are not able to be here, we will get their gift to them. If you are their immediate relative here today and they couldn't be here and want to take that to them, that would be great. Uh, will save us a step. So uh, after worship, if I'm turning with technology, I am making sure that all my cameras look connected and I'm also not on, my phone's not ringing. But if you want to uh, take that to them afterwards as well, that would be fine too if you're a grandparent or so, so whatnot. But we're glad you're here. I've got some announcements to make and I know Susie does as well. Cheerful Hearts will, is back June the 7th. We had, we've had two meetings and they've been fantastic. We've had like 30 people at each one. So June the 7th at 1130 at the Dogwood Cafe in Amherst. It'll be a nice menu, uh, only $7.15, $7.15 including the drink. And I have sampled those lunches and they are good. Uh, we will have the whole restaurant uh, and so it's gonna be exciting. Please call Betty Bailey for a reservation and it will be good. Uh, it'll be good country cooking, so that is fun, and it's been great to get that group back. Uh, so we are excited about that. Tonight, the youth will meet at 6, the entire youth group, as we normally do. But tonight, we will be eating uh, in honor of the graduates. We like to eat anyway, but we'll be eating in honor of the graduates. So if you're a graduate, and if your family wants to come with you as a graduate, come on. But we're having chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A, yes, on a Sunday. We figured it out. It's just our secret, but we've got it. And then some salad and some other things. So, uh, but we're gonna do dodgeball and we got some video games upstairs set up. It's just gonna be a fun night just to celebrate with you as a graduate. The youth program's going very well on Sunday nights. Our Bible study leaders are doing a great job and we've seen a lot of kids coming in. So we just wanna have a good time tonight and just celebrate this time of the year. The nominating committee meeting will meet uh, Tuesday at 10.30. The youth director search team, and you know if you're on that team, uh, will be meeting at 6 on Tuesday. And just to give you a quick little blurb, we are working. Uh, you might wonder, is anything happening? Oh, we are. We have already been working on the job description and what we feel will be appropriate. We've also been doing some listening sessions with the youth and with parents and others. And so once we complete the first phase of what we need to do, you as a church will get to approve that before we begin actually looking for a candidate. But uh, we are moving on, moving on down the road and it is going well. So pray for us as we continue to get that ball down the court and, and soon, hopefully soon, you'll get to give us uh, some approval so we can get moving. Uh, Wednesday, there are softball games and is it this week too? Yes, so we'll put that on Facebook, but if you're interested in church softball, I see Patty's here, you can contact the church, we'll put you in touch, Patty, or you can contact Brandon, but you know, if you're interested in playing, let us know, we'll put you, I, I don't know much about the team itself, not personally, because I'm not a coach or a player, but I will put you in contact with the people that will help you uh, with that. Uh, also, another exciting thing, I know next weekend is a holiday weekend, it's Memorial Day, but we do have a baptism already lined up for next Sunday. So if you're interested in baptism uh, at the end of the service, if you want to talk to me, um, we certainly could do that. But if you're going to be out of town next weekend, we can. this will be our fourth baptism, so we certainly can line up another Sunday to fill up the tub. We would certainly ex be willing to do that. Uh, anyway, that's what's going on. Miss Susie, if you want to come share your announcements, then we will get started. Well, first of all, uh, let me say that um, the music committee was supposed to have a meeting today, and that music director forgot. So, that crazy music director. So, we will not be meeting today, music committee, and I will let you know when we reschedule that. Uh, also, uh, Christy let me know that Kids in Action is not going to meet from this Wednesday or until the fall. 
correct. So kids in action, get ready for fall, but we will not be meeting during the summer. Of course, Vacation Bible School is right around the corner, so uh, there will be plenty of things to do. Also, for kids in the room today of all ages, there's a special uh, piece that we're going to do uh, in your program. It's listed as the little boy and his lunch. And so I'll, I'm asking children, if you're planning to go to Children's Church, wait until after we do that song and enjoy that uh, little bit of drama and music together. Uh, also, we are playing today uh, without one of our members. And if you've ever been part of a handbell choir, you know everybody is essential. And so this member is sick, so I ask you to pray for her, uh, but pray for us too as we try to uh, fill in the gaps uh, with her uh, absence today. So uh, we will begin unless you have something else to say. I was asked about VBS, one of the bell ringers. Raise your hand, Miss Katie. That's your director, so if you have questions, see her. I know it will be July before we blink, so you'll be hearing more as we get closer, but I was asked that today, so we've got a lot already planned, but we certainly, if you have questions, ask Miss Katie. We'll begin, and um, graduates, you, uh, you will uh, come in as you hear the bells ring.
we're going to recognize our seniors and uh, look like we've got a good group to help pass up the Bible. So if, you're, if they're not here, we still want to read the names of our graduates. And, but if you're here, we'd like you to come up. First, we've got Miss Hannah Mason from Amherst County High School receiving the Golden A Trophy Award this year. And she wants to pursue options in animal care. Miss Hannah? All right. <laughs> Excited for her. We have Miss Allison Morcom here. She has Amherst County High School graduates. She's going to go to CVCC, uh, then JMU, and wants to do business management and become a realtor. <laughs> a couple of names I'm going to mention uh, who are not here right now, but Mr. Riley Austin from East Glass High School wants to go to the Air Force. We have Braden French, Jefferson Forest High School, wanting to attend v uh, Virginia Tech. Noah Henson, Amherst High School, plans on pursuing a trade school career. We have Andrew McCormick, E.C. Glass High School, attending Honors College and Physical Therapy Program at the University of Lynchburg. Though they're not here, many of their family are, so let's give them a hand. We do have present Daryl Rucker, Amherst High School, CVCC, then transferring to George Mason, interested in pursuing information technology. While she's not here, we celebrate with Michaela Johnson, who gets her degree from Amherst High School, wants to join the Air Force, become a police officer in the K-9 unit is a dream, and we celebrate her. And then present, we've got Jonah Cunningham, Amherst High School, Virginia uh, Technical Institute is his plan, completing his welding program. Not present, but we do want to celebrate Carlin Saunders, who has Sweetbriar College, and she'll be teaching at Mountain View Elementary School. And then Connor Peters gets a, is getting another degree from the University of Virginia to become a school teacher, a uh, secondary school teacher. Anyone else graduating in any school at all that's here today was too humble to call me? Would you wait? Would you just put your hand in the air so we can at least say congratulations. Anyone in this room? Okay. All right. I know you guys were thrilled to have to get in front of us because you got to do it again and again and again, right? It's like all these programs, all these awards, but we're super proud of you and we've watched you grow up and we know you're going to accomplish great things. And so let us brag on you and applaud and do all those pictures that your parents are going to take until you're tired of getting your picture made because it is a great achievement that you have accomplished. And so we're going to have a prayer of blessing for you, but it's been my honor as your pastor just to continue to watch you grow and I cannot wait to hear all the great things you're going to do. So let us, let us pray. God, we celebrate with the graduates in our church, those who can be here, those who cannot. We love them. We've watched them grow up as little children into young adults and now uh, beginning to pursue dreams and goals for a lifetime. And so we just trust them to your care and we pray that they will always know that they are loved by you and that you are a part of their lives and that following you in whatever career and path that they choose is the true means of success. And so we pray for them. We pray for their families. This is an emotional time. It can be difficult. None of us like to see our kids grow up, whether it's entering school for the first day, getting in that big yellow bus, graduating, and, or, or going off and moving away. All of those are emotional moments of great pride, but also moments where we need prayer. We give thanks in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all in this congregation say, God bless you. To the Lord, you righteous, it is fitting for the upright to praise him, Praise the Lord with the harp, make music to him on the ten-string lyre, sing to him a new song, play skillfully, and shout for joy. I invite you to stand together as we sing hymn number 52. The uh, one on your sheet is not correct. Number 52 is, Oh, Worship the King. I invite you to stand as we prepare to get the offering today. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray. God, we give these gifts this day in gratitude and thanksgiving. We celebrate, we rejoice. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
tis, get a task, get a green and yellow bags. There are people out there. <laughs> hmm. Well, as you can see, I am not green or yellow. I am your basic brown basket. And I serve many uses. Everything, including the shopping. And I'm none of this paper or plastic, disposable stuff. I'm an important part of the family. My name is Cub. That's C-U-B. It stands for Common Use Basket. But you can call me Cub. Hey, hey. hey Barley Brothers. Hey, Fish. Well, I hang out with these two food groups. You see, every weekday, I go to Hebrew school with a little boy named... My little boy is named John Jacob Abraham Matthias Jeremiah David Joshua Goldstein. But I call him Jake for short. Jake's mom lines me with a clean cloth napkin. That is my favorite. And packs me with a fish sandwich for Jake's lunch. On Saturdays, Jake packs me himself. We go fishing, climbing sycamore trees, and we practice shooting rocks into the creek with the new slingshot. Special edition. Cool. Yeah. How right you are, basket buddies. Jake's proud of that slingshot. He's good with it, too. That's why I was surprised when something happened a couple of weeks ago. Jake wanted to go to the slingshot tournament. The grand prize was a complete set of David and Goliath training cards. But the, but the tournament was on church day. Jake pleaded with his mom to let him skip church. Aww. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, well, but mom had her priorities right. She said being honored with a pack of trading cards didn't compare to honoring God. And that was the end of that. Yes, mom. Uh, however, she did make Jake an extra big picnic lunch. Two whole fish and five loaves of barley bread. Jake's mom was in a big hurry to get to church. A really popular preacher named Jesus was speaking that day and she wanted to get a good seat. She wasn't kidding. When we got to church, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Finally, the deacons, they had to set up extra chairs in the Salmart parking lot next door. <laughs> Jake's mom let him go sit up front with his friends. He put me down by a basket named Catch-All. That was one excited basket. said that Jesus was a miracle worker and that he claimed to be the Son of God. I thought he was exaggerating. But when I heard what Jesus said about God and his kingdom, I got a funny feeling that maybe Catch-All was right. Jesus was a good preacher, all right. He had a lot to say. He kept preaching and preaching through lunch and snack time, high tea, even past supper and dessert. Everyone had eaten their picnic lunch a long time ago. Well, almost everyone. Go on, tell him. Everyone but Jake. I guess he was tired of fish sandwiches. Maybe he ate out of some other boy's basket, but he forgot all about me. Amazing thing happened. 
Jesus' helpers, the disciples, they pulled Jesus aside and they said, Can't each of you or everyone's stomach corral in their country? Tell the people to get something at the fast fish drive through Yeah, but Jesus looked them straight in the face and said, You be The disciples, they looked at Jesus like he was two fish sandwiches short of a Happy Meal. They knew it would take over six months' salary to buy enough fish sticks for all those people. They told Jesus they didn't have that much money. Jesus gave them one long look. What do you have, he asked. All of a sudden, someone yanked my handle. It was Jake. He could listen to the whole conversation. He ran up to the disciples and he said, Here, misters, Jesus can have my lunch. It's not much, but it's all I have. And what happened next was so incredible, it still unravels my weave. Jesus lifted me high, looked up into heaven, and prayed that God would bless Jake's lunch. Then he set me down, reached in, and brought out one of the five barley breads. I watched him break it into pieces and place it in the baskets of the disciples. Jesus reached in again. He took a fish. He broke it into bite-sized pieces, and he put it in the disciples' baskets. And that's when I noticed it. There were still two fish and five barley breads lying on my plaid napkin. No matter how many fish and barley breads Jesus took out, more appeared out of nowhere. It was a miracle. The disciples passed around the baskets and everyone had a helping. Then the baskets were passed by again. And everyone had seconds. And then thirds. And then fourths. Well, you get the idea. When everyone was bursting at the seams, the disciples took up 12 baskets of leftovers, including me. I've never held so much food in my entire life. When Jake and his mom got home, they put the leftovers into 20 sandwich bags and placed them in the freezer. And do you know what Jake found in the bottom of his basket? A complete set of David and Goliath trading cards. Yay! Yay! Yeah, no, I was, I was just kidding about the cards. Aww. Aww. But what Jake did get was a memory of a miracle and the truth behind it. When we give Jesus all that we have, even if it's just a little bit, he will make more than we could ever imagine. Oh, wait. Oh, no, I know that sound. Jake's mom's going to the freezer. She's going to get one of those fish sandwiches. Oh, gosh, they're so... Oh, I hear her coming. Oh, no, she's getting closer. She's getting closer. She's... Ah! Oh, gosh, those things are so cold. We need to have a conversation about plastic or paper. You can pick up the children in the youth room after church as they head out. We've got some more coming here, Miss Christy. All right. Yep. Okay, we're going to move into our time of prayer, and I know there are a lot of needs we have. And as we continue to see God's movement in our church, uh, as I said, we have a baptism next week. We celebrate that. And then we're only two weeks away from Loyalty Day. And uh, Grant Carter and I have already spoken. He's going to be back with us to preach. And we are bringing back the Loyalty Day Mill. It's been a couple of years. Can I get an amen on that? Uh, that's a very good thing. And so uh, I bring that as part of the prayer to say that's a thing of gratitude. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for all the blessings God gives. So you probably have some as well. We continue to pray for the needs. Uh, continue to pray for Bev and her family at the loss of her mother and all the other needs that we have in our church family. So let's turn to God. Gracious God, we lift up these, na these names and needs before you.
We give thanks for the following. God, we gather on a day where we celebrate through the bells and the hymns and the words and the songs, a day of worship. We're thankful for a beautiful day. We're thankful for our graduates, and we celebrate with them and the, just the excitement that is going on in this time of the year. And we're thankful that we are seeing Loyalty Day and Mills and Ministries and Missions and Vacation Bible School and all the things that we know are vital and important to our mission and our ministry and to our fellowship and to just enjoying the celebration of following you. We lift up in gratitude a big thanks to you, God, and we seek you this day, and may you speak to us so that you can speak through us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, and all God's people say. Susie threw that bell, remind me when Jerry Lee Lewis slammed the piano down, so she was into it. I saw Jerry Lee tear up a piano once. Some of you don't get that, but that's all right. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14 is our text, and it is a trippy, spacey, crazy one, but I promise you it'll make some sense, and I think it will give us a challenge for the day. Hear the scripture. 
In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and the mind of a human being was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its enemies, victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. And while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of its first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thorns were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming from the, with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and f- sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of God. Let's pray. God, in this language of visions and dreams, speak to us in our world of work and school and life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Woodrow Wilson once said this, A man's rootage is more important than his leavage. Roots are more important than the leaves. And I like that because it tells us that the foundation, the root of it all, is what we got to start with. That's what makes a person matter. A person's character matters. Because everything else flows from those roots. And without a foundation, everything will fall. Nothing can last. And so we continue this conversation on character. I said we'd take five aspects that would make up character in world number four. And if you know, character, again, is the person we are. It's who we hope to be, one that will reflect Christ. And so as we look at character and we think about the recipe or the DNA strands of it, we've talked about several things. We started with conviction that our beliefs and our values match our deeds if we have character. We explored integrity, that what we believe and do better be honest and trustworthy. And then last week we said that this will all take courage because you got to have guts to do the right thing to live out your faith. We're using this with the backdrop of Daniel, and up until now it's been pretty fun to talk about because the stories are just so great. Today we get into some of that strange language. But the word we have before us is one we need, especially on a graduation day. The word we have before us is a good word, and it is trust. Trust. We need to talk about trust Because once we have conviction, integrity, and courage, it's going to take some trust to live this out. We have to trust the great God we believe and worship if we're going to get anything or go anywhere. Trust. And the best advice I give to any graduate from any school today is we have to believe that in our life God is with us. Trust that God is speaking to us. Trust that God loves us. 
the great author and preacher, one of the top voted preachers uh, in America was the Episcopal priest Barbara Brown Taylor. Uh, she still teaches and lectures. She's mainly retired now. But she was struggling years ago with a sense of call, trying to figure out how God wanted to use her in the beginning days of her ministry. She wondered what, what she should do. She had so many passions and interests. Should she be a writer, a preacher, a teacher? Ironically, she did all three of those in her lifetime, but she was struggling with which path to take. And so when midnight she fell into prayer and she prayed, she said, Okay, God, God, you need to level with me. What are you calling me to do? And she said later that she really did feel that God spoke to her at that moment. God was saying, what pleases you? Do it. Belong to me, but do what pleases you. And here's what I mean, and I think she means. God is never going to take you into a place that goes against who God is. But God will take your interest and your passion and connect that with what God wants to do in the world. And that is pretty beautiful. If we trust this God to connect us to the work out there from the interests and the abilities and the talents we have within, well, that's how you find your purpose for life. The key is do what you do, but make sure it pleases God and that it honors God. And if it pleases and honors God, then go for it and follow your dreams and be who God asks you to be. But a good question is, is, is God's call touching the place where I am most joyful? What really excites me and gives me passion and gives me joy when I can connect that to God then you got the real life. It's a great question because at graduations, everybody's asking and you get sick of hearing this because we adults ask you at 18 years old, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? At 18, I was more concerned about what I was going to have for lunch than trying to figure out my destiny. So take a breath. You don't have to figure it all out today. But the key is connecting your joy and passion with God's joy and passion. My friends... That's the stuff. Frederick Buechner said, Our calling is where our deepest gladness and the world's hunger meet. Your joy and the needs of the world connect them. Place your hands in the hands of God. Okay, let's talk about Daniel. We've talked about how Daniel and his friends were in captivity. We've talked about the fiery furnace, Daniel in the lion's den, all great Sunday school stories. But I told you half the book is metaphorical. Half the book sounds like the book of Revelation. Half the book sounds like Jimi Hendrix playing in the 1960s. And I'm not joking. It is way out there. Beasts and monsters and scenes. And so we're moving into that territory, but I'm only going to do that, do that this week and next week because it's a lot there. And a lot of readers get lost in the haze, and I don't want to do that. But if you look at chapter 7, remember this. The book of Daniel was to give hope to the Hebrews who were always facing defeat by their enemies. The Babylonians and the Persians and then later the Greeks and then we'll know in the New Testament the Romans. And what it tells us is that there are all these empires that come to, to oppress, to hurt and harm God's people. And in moments like that, they need to know that there is one bigger than the empire that they are, that's squashing them. And that is God. And so, in this chapter, it goes back to the Babylonian times because the book of Daniel goes back and forth. And there's a dream and a vision, and he sees these four great beasts appearing. Yes, four monsters coming out of the ocean. You, did, you heard me right. Four monsters coming out of the ocean. And this is not literal. This is symbolic. These beasts represent something. They are symbols, not literal monsters, but they sure act like monsters. The first is a lion with wings like an eagle. The second is a bear with ribs in his mouth. The third is a leopard with wings and four heads. And the fourth is some crazy monstrosity straight out of Hollywood. And they were, it was terrifying and worse than the others, and it destroyed all the others, and it had all these horns, ten, of course. And then another horn appears with the eyes of a human being and begins to speak. Yes, it makes you wonder what Daniel had for supper that night before he went to bed crazy dream, but it has meaning and purpose to it. It really does remind me of those movies my son and I love to watch of Godzilla. And even when I was a kid, the early Godzilla movies that we've rewatched, you know, Mothra, Mothra the three-headed beast, the Robert, robot creature, and Godzilla, these monsters coming out of the ocean. And that's, that's not a mistake because I'm a big fan of science fiction. I love science fiction. And in the ancient world, they had a form of literature that was the science fiction of its day, uh, they didn't have spaceships because they didn't know about all that, but they had a, a science fiction, a fantasy literature called apocalyptic literature. And we have examples of this both in the Bible and outside of the Bible. And, and these, these stories were of monsters and beasts, but they had meanings to them. They were ways to tell stories. And so what do they mean? 
Well, from reading the rest of the chapter and from reading biblical history and from scholars, you kind of put a sense together of kind of what we think is going on here. And yes, you'll find people who argue and disagree, but the best guesstimation is what I'm going to give you. Lions, the first monster, they are symbols of power and might. They represent power. And the fact that it has a mind of a human, meaning this is an aggressive, smart beast, it's a dangerous empire. The bear, the next one, is also a symbol of power and devouring. The leopard is swift and fearsome. And the last is just so terrifying. They each represent a different empire and power that crushed the Jews. If you look at Daniel 2, you see a statue, and it does the same thing. And that one, you're welcome to read that on your own. But these four empires are there, and they're terrifying, and they're threatening, and they want to know how they can survive it. Daniel's focus is clear that the empires and the powers that come, they come like monsters and they come awfully powerful and they come to threaten us, but they cannot and will not win. In our own day, we've used symbols to represent kingdoms of our day. The eagle represents the nation we live. The bear is Russia, not in this Bible, but in our own world today. You know, we use symbols. And so that's what they did then too. So let's talk about it. Best guess, the golden excuse me, the lion would be Babylon, that first empire that we've been studying that oppresses the Jews. The bear, many think, is the Medes. Uh, the leopard is the Persians. And of course, uh, this book was completed and finished later, and so many believe that final most terrifying beast would be the Greek empire, right before the Romans came. And there were 10 Greek rulers in a row, represented by the ten horns, and then the 11th to pop up was the Adolf Hitler of their day, Antigonus Epiphanes IV, the worst and most cruel and vicious man the Jews had ever faced. And so you see kind of how they're giving this out to show you that each of these empires exist, and they all think they're going to win, but they won't. Now, if you can disagree all you want, and you can think about other empires, I'm not really here to argue that, but what I do know from this book is this that no matter how big and powerful the monsters of their or our day may be, there is only one kingdom that lasts, and it is the kingdom of God. Now, Daniel wakes up all troubled by this vision. He can't get it out of his mind. And, but one thing you saw in that vision is he thinks about the Ancient of Days, which is a divine title for God, and then he has this vision of a son of man coming to rescue all. Christians later will call Jesus the son of man. Interesting, confusing, you bet, but certainly needed. And here's why. This is what this has to do with today. You may not know this, but I bet you do. Monsters still exist. They still do. They're not Godzilla and Mothra and King Kong. They're not even the monsters of my childhood, Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, and Freddy Krueger. Uh, but they're there. And who are these monsters? Well, there are still empires. Ask the Ukrainians. As Russia rolls right in, and devastates and weighs laced to a land. But you don't have to be a nation invaded by another nation to have monsters. We have monsters. We call them viruses and mutations and COVID-19. We have shootings in Buffalo, New York, people going to buy birthday cakes and going about their business and not coming home. We have a lot of monsters and boogeymen in our day that keep us up at night. If you're a parent, graduates, you may not uh, experience this yet, but you will one day. You leave home and you wonder why your parents are never asleep completely until you, you get home, right? While we track you on our cell phones, because we do. We, it's not that we don't trust our children, we love our children, but we don't trust the monsters in our world. And so we're just always, aren't we, nervous and concerned about the things that we fear. As adults, we grow up and we face the monsters of cancer, the monsters of debt, the monsters of divorce, the monsters of stress and pain and hurt. I think I'd trade them for a lion with a bunch of wings or a leopard. But I got good news, great news. Those monsters are no more powerful than the monsters Daniel dreamt of because God is still bigger than all those monsters. Do we not believe that? This may be an ancient and archaic scripture that I really thought sounded good when I first planned this sermon series, and then when I got to the week of, I really wished I'd chosen to preach on the fish and the loaves, because that's a much more simple, neat story. This one is so strange. But I think we need this story today. I think it helps with the other story, 
The Jesus who came with bread and fish to show that there's a new kingdom coming that's going to meet our needs and help us that we need. God wants to give you peace and strength. God wants you to know you can handle all of those beasts and monsters. Now, I'm not promising a cure for cancer or a problem-free philosophy, but I am saying the God who was with those exiles, who literally went with them and through the lion's den and the fiery furnace, will be your God in your time of exile. Your God is with you. Your God is my God. God will be with you at the funeral home, the court, the ICU, the ER. God will be with you, and you will not be defeated. Death cannot even win. How do we know this God loves us? How do we know that? Well, all that God has done is out of love for you. God is trying to improve us, reshape us, transform us because of that love to make us better than we are and to give us abundant life, which is a life greater than any other force can offer you. And the monsters and forces of hurt and fear will not win because only a God of love can win. Here's how this comes home today. This has to be more than just ancient kingdoms and power struggles, though we still see that playing out. But no matter how big the monster is, I want to tell you it will lose. Death doesn't even get the last word. If you want to make it through today and tomorrow and the rest of your life, there are four words that this scripture will help you with. Just four. And you can wake up in the morning and repeat it. And you can go to bed and repeat it. And it will get you through Monday. And that is this. God must be boss. The problem is, we give, some, we give all these other powers top authority, but God must be boss. Put your life into that reality, and your reality will change. There is a legend I want to close with. It's just a legend. Every time I tell this legend, somebody stops me and says, now where is that in the New Testament? If this is outside of the Bible. It's a legend about the Apostle Paul that was told and has been told before, and I don't know if it ever happened. That's why it's called a legend. But I like to think it happened because it's really cool. But there is a legend that a wealthy businessman was traveling through the ancient Mediterranean world, and what he wanted to do was meet this Paul. And so he ran into Timothy, and he talked to Timothy about Paul, and he said, can I meet him? Can, I, can you connect me? Well, he didn't say it that way, but you get the point. Uh, I want to meet this Paul. And so they arranged a visit, and at that time, Paul was a prisoner in Rome. And so this businessman steps into the cell, and the merchant was surprised because he thought he'd see almost like an action superhero, but instead he saw a rather old man, physically frail, in the end of life, you know, not dying, but, you know, reaching the end of his career life. And they talked for hours and hours. And before he left, he got a blessing from Paul, a prayer. Outside the prison, uh, he, was at, he, he, he asked Timothy again, what is the secret of this man's power? I have never seen anything like him before. I mean, physically he was tired, he was older, he just was a human. But being in his presence, he was moved and touched and he saw the power of Paul. And he said, what is his secret? And Timothy said, did you not guess? No. He said, Paul, Paul is in love. The merchant thought, in love? Like, with who? And he said, yes, Paul is in love with Jesus Christ. And the merchant was so confused. He said, is that all? And Timothy said, sir, that is everything. Trust. I'm calling you today to trust this God. Trust doesn't mean you always understand or even see the full picture. I'm smart enough to know that my kids don't always think I know what I'm talking about. Don't say anything. They questioned me, and I questioned my parents. But I still followed my parents because I trusted them. And I knew that my mom and dad weren't perfect, but I knew they wanted what was best for me and had my back. And so if they thought I should do something, I really did follow my dad's advice because I figured dad was dad and he knew. I am a very, very frail dad in the presence of God. So God is a God worthy of your trust. Cast your cares, your concerns, your fears on God. Look, I could go on, but all I can say to you is this. We all know that we live in a world that is pretty messed up at times. And I get sick of the shootings and the violence and the killing for just the sake of killing I don't know how many more tyrants are going to roll their tanks into more cities and bomb more hospitals that I will live to see in my lifetime. But I refuse to give them the power that they so want because we serve a God who gets the last word. And we serve a God who will bring peace. 
and we serve a God where love really will win. Don't forget that. Don't lose that. Love will win. The ark is long, but it'll get us there. And we will get there together. So I invite you to trust this God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Buffalo. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Amherst County. For those in this room and those in this place who are tired of the bears and the eagles and the monsters that come out of the ocean. But we know you've got this. You're with us. We will stay faithful. We will stay loyal. There is so much more at work that we just can't see. We trust you, God. May we trust one another as we walk this path together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of decision is Trust and Obey, a wonderful hymn of faith, 509. Please stand to your feet if you want to respond. We do have a baptism next Sunday. You're welcome to join. But if you say, I can't be baptized next Sunday, but I still want to be, still you can come. We'll talk about that. We'll set up another time. Um, If you would like to unite with the church, if there's anything we can do for you, let us stand as we sing. It's a busy time of the year, and I'm hoping that this week is a good one for you. Uh, how many of you have still got some graduation events to go to this week? Anybody in the next week or two? We got some. How many have been to a lot? You hear a lot of speeches at these things, so I'm not going to give you one now. But uh, I do pray that you'll 
just celebrate and have fun, even if it is a three hour. We were at a graduation once, and the speaker said, you know, all good speeches should have three points. He said, but this speech is going to have three sets of three. And he did. <laughs> Those bleachers really started hurting. But there was good stuff in that. So listen and pull out some things that will encourage you, but take some photos and have some memories. Enjoy that time. It is, an, it is great and wonderful. And so uh, we'll be praying for all of you. I hope it's a great week. We look forward to hearing those stories. Um, as we go through the week, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. We're looking forward to Memorial Day weekend. And then after that, Loyalty Day. And I know I was joking, but I'm really not. There is a sign that having that meal back, it's the first time, uh, is very important. And uh, it's a sign of just, just a relief. And I know we're not out of the woods, as they say, but at the same time, it sure feels good to be able to do it. So may God bless you as you have a good week. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, be with us as we leave today to go to the places you take us. Your love is amazing. Your grace is just beyond words. Thank you for the bells. Thank you for these wonderful young people coming forward. We celebrate with them at their graduations, their successes, their hard work. We just pray and wish nothing but your blessing upon them because they are a blessing to us. Be with us this day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people say.